everybody, so welcome to this year's first episode of the Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase Winter Edition. And this is where you get to sample a lot of the new cool technology in the Knowledge Graph space without always having to reach out to the salespeople, which I'm sure you can appreciate. Okay, so today we are going to be talking to Usearch, which is a different kind of search engine that has Knowledge Graph under its foundation, but more importantly, it allows you, if you are a business, to customize the kind of search that you are performing, which sounds pretty cool. The other thing we're gonna talk about is Roy and I have a bone to pick with each other because he has said in the past that he doesn't think taxonomy is very useful. I have a difference of opinion, but the good thing is at the end of our conversation, you'll see where we actually found some common ground. Okay, so if this sounds interesting to you, Make sure to keep on watching. Anyways, all right, so we are gonna be talking today about some of the work that you do. We're gonna talk about, do you need a taxonomy or not? And it's all gonna be a friendly dialogue, so don't worry, it's gonna be, I think it's fun. I, I really wanna hear your perspective on this because I have questions. I have questions for you, Roy, because I think taxonomies are very needed in search but you have a different opinion, which is fine. All right, so before we get started, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Roy, I'm the founder and CEO of FuseSurge. Um, we are building internet search engines. Uh, I've been uh, working in this field for the last seven years. Uh, Usearch was founded in 2018. And uh, we really try to build technologies to uh, make internet search accessible to anyone. It's a great place to be. It's really a place where AI, you can really see, you can really see the strength of AI. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one thing that I, I would agree on is it's, it's an exciting place to, to, to be working in and search, but it also can be a little scary, right? Like there's some things, especially in the news nowadays, where there's, you know, some bias concerns with the algorithms and, you know, that type of thing. So we'll get to those questions in a minute. But before we do that, you mentioned B2B and B2C. So who are the main uh, folks that are going to be using something that you are building? So we are working, we are customizing our internet search engine to industries, say commercial real estate, say um, asset management, say media and broadcasting. So we are adapting B2C into B2B. And B2B is very interesting because in B2B, you want to see the data, you want to organize the data. We will discuss taxonomy soon. Like say I'm in commercial real estate. I want to see deals. I want to see loans. I want to see lawsuits. I want to see back rents. I have so many things I want to see. And then after I organize the data, I want to structure the data. I want to extract, for example, the buyer, the seller, the property, the amount. So it's an amazing funnel that you start with the search engine and then organize the data and then structureize the data and then visualize the data. I want to see a list of all the commercial real estate activities of Google. How can mm -hmm. I see this information? Go to Google, do Google real estate, you won't find anything. And yeah. that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to, to shrink the, sp the space, clean the noise, mm -hmm. and the large scale. Because I didn't understand that context. Exactly. Uh, and I think that's very similar to the, the problem that you're describing here. So here's one thing that I would I would challenge uh, on this though. So Roy, what you're describing sounds an awful lot like a taxonomy already, right? So if a, even though you're not using a taxonomy, the clients that are coming in that you have have a taxonomy, whether they call it that or not, of, of a list of of companies that they or products that they are trying to track, right? So it is still important. It just might not be what is backing your uh, algorithms, right? Yeah. So, so of course, it's not only the companies. It's, for example, the you want to define the, you, you, want, you have an article. You, you, you want to organize the data. For example, this is financial news. This is a personal announcement. This mm -hmm. is fundraising. This is an exit. This is an investment. These are all taxonomies sitting behind. And for a B2B, so for a B2B, it's an amazing tool. For the B2C, you won't like my answer. So okay. I, I, I beg your pardon in advance. So <laughs> We're all friends here. It's fine. <laughs> and coming from internet search, which is a graveyard, you know how many attempts were to build internet search engine. It's such a challenging problem. Until you don't try to build an internet search engine, you don't really understand what you're facing. You will see the weirdest things ever. Search <laughs> queries, because they are contextual and captures how humans think and interact, 
it's, it's, it's a co very complicated stuff. I think that taxonomies or ontologies don't make any sense at all. Why? <laughs> Let me tell you why. Yes, tell me why. Say I have 20 billion web pages. That's what I have, 20 billion pages. That's what Google has in English. Now, suppose I have a taxonomy. I have an amazing taxonomy. Say, it, say I have like 10,000 categories. Amazing, huge taxonomy that I built. Took me 10 years to build it. If I map 20 billion web pages onto te into 10,000 categories, I get buckets or clusters of size 2 million. Now, what good can come out of buckets with 2 million items? Nothing. So for internet search engine, because the volumes are so huge, it doesn't make sense. And you can see, for example, that all those attempts to incorporate taxonomies into internet search, you know, once people use all those web directories, it's, it, it doesn't work. Now for B2B, that's a completely different, sto different mm -hmm. story. Taxonomy mm -hmm. will be extremely helpful to organize knowledge. Mm -hmm. data education, it's knowledge a smaller data event. set, right? Right. Yeah. Say I'm an e-commerce site. Wow, of course, it makes complete sense to map my product into a product taxonomy. I can't mm -hmm. think of anything else. But what happens when, when I saw people using taxonomies for internet search? Because you want your taxonomy to serve as a mediator between the documents and the search queries. Now, this is the, the, the false assumption that people are making. You might think that taxonomies might, might help you to understand user intent or might help you to, uh, to, 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 int to, to understand interaction between user queries and web pages, but this won't happen. So and one thing I would ask though is, if that's true, how does query expansion happen? Context, okay. So I can tell you the way usage is doing query expansion. The best way to do query expansion is to gather many, 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 many user queries and see how users are expanding query. Say I have Taylor Swift, let's see, let's see what popular queries look like. Taylor Swift songs, Taylor Swift albums, Taylor Swift Katy Perry, Taylor Swift Nina Gomez. The only way to do query ex augmentation and query expansion in the best way is only by using those contextuality that is hidden inside the user queries. Let me give you an example. Suppose I'm, I'm entering the, the, the video game GTA. Mm -hmm. Now, what good, I go to my taxonomy and I see that GTA is a game. Amazing, okay. it's a video game. Now, it doesn't really help me. It's really redundant. I don't, wanna, I don't want to restrict now to web pages that have GTA game in the title together. Or sometimes I want, I might want to show the main page of GTA, like GTA.com and the word game, it's redundant. I don't want it. So mm -hmm. an example that the expansion with the taxonomy might, might make, it, it won't help me. And in the end, don't forget that it's finite. But I, I think, I think in the world where we now have conceptual uh, search with concepts, that is where Knowledge Graph actually takes on the taxonomies and allows you to have, yeah, you have GTA, but no longer is that in isolation. You're saying GTA is connected to um, another video game like The Witcher. Like if it's connected to other things and how is it connected to those other things? Those other things, if they are co-located on those web pages, gives the search engine more to go off of. So I would agree that a traditional categorization type taxonomy is just going to give you buckets of things and you don't really know the relation between them. However, I think a lot of people that watch my channel at least might start to understand that you have to expand your taxonomy into more of a class structure right. so that if you have GTA, it's just the um, label representation of GTA. And then all the things that mean GTA, all the words that people use to describe GTA are connected to that concept. And then that concept is connected to its like-minded things. So you get more context, right? Definitely. That's exactly what we call at user the contextual graph. I have GTA, I have the forms it appears, I have the contextual association, which are related video games, I have related characters, that's exactly, this is contextuality. But you still have to have 
something to be the target for the search engine. So if I typed in um, Selena Gomez lips, there's not a lot of things in there to tell you that I'm actually talking about, I can't remember the name of it, but she has a new makeup line. There's nothing in my text that says that, but there should be something that connects those two things together. So how does that work if you're not using some kind of controlled vocabulary or at least class structure on the back end? Yeah, of course you're of course you're using for every entity. Of course, this is what we call a graph. So, so, so I call it like our contextual graph. You, you, you must um, have a graph that captures those contextual associations yep. that can take you from one to the other. Yeah, no, and I, I love that. So that's one thing that I do want to highlight in all of this, that I agree with you that a static, I would call it maybe old school categorization of things like this thing only has one tag and it belongs under that tag that can still work for the uh, B2B, as you said, because they're organizing a finite amount of things on their website and it's the things that matter to them. But once you go into the wild west of a search engine where people are just using all kinds of words and you don't know what slang they might be saying, you know, it's it's a little bit more complex. So those taxonomies have a time and a place and you can still use uh, control uh, classes in a search engine without calling them necessarily a taxonomy, although it is another version of control vocabulary. So I agree with you on that. Our secret sauce that we use AI to uh, imitate this uh, um, crowdsourcing or how would you call it like wisdom of the crowd wisdom of the crowd but google did use a taxonomy to do all of that um, until quite recently so um, it's called yago right like you probably know what i'm talking about that's what they used they used uh yago and circ and you know all of those huge manually curated knowledge graphs to actually do the question and answering another common example that isn't using the sophistication that you're talking about with AI is Watson. You know, Watson is kind of like, eh, not, not so great anymore um, in the public eye. But back in the day when it was like beating Jeopardy, everyone's like, oh, that's so amazing. Literally, it was just trained on Wikipedia articles. Right. And the taxonomy that it was giving answers was the title of the Wikipedia article. So a lot of people think that some of this question answering can be so sophisticated and it needs to be, um, you know, something that they have to spend years uh, creating this machine learning when really sometimes if it's a small data set and uh, they can use some of these other resources that are knowledge base, uh, you know, focused instead of AI focused or they can come talk to you if they are interested in that AI part, right? Because you already figured that out, right? So for those that might not be familiar with what you all do, how do you compare to something like Google or Bing? I mean, is this a replacement for those things or is it um, pairing up with those? Like, how does that work? Our goal, ultimate goal is to be competitive to Google and Bing. We mm -hmm. are not there yet. I mean, we don't have the scale, of course, of Google and Bing. But where we are doing really good uh, when comparing to Google and Bing uh, according to benchmarks that we conduct is in the area of custom search engines. So mm. once you restrict us into, say, 100 sites or 1,000 sites, say mm. 100 million web pages that we know that we can co cover entirely, then mm. there we can get very close to Google and Bing. So on smaller scales, we can we can get very close. So you mentioned that you are our best suited right now, at least on those, you know, kind of curated, uh, still big, but curated data sets compared to what Google or Bing can do or DuckDuckGo and some of the others that are out there. So how does that curation work? Is that something that you and your team is doing or is that something that you work with the actual customer to figure out? Google is the most amazing search engine ever in giving you the best answer for any question. It's the best hit and answer tool. Give it a question, it will answer. It does it amazingly. But mm -hmm. what Google doesn't do, Google doesn't generate data sets and Google mm -hmm. doesn't generate list of answers. Example, Google, show me all the commercial real estate deals that happened in the last three months from those lists of 300 companies. I can't answer that. And here mm -hmm. I need a list. Show me all the deployments of telecommunication products in the last three months. It can't answer that. These are the data sets that our clients want. Mm -hmm. 
we do, we build custom search engine around the vertical or industry. Mm -hmm. And then they define what is the data set they want to see. And mm -hmm. we're training some machine learning algorithm to extract the data sets from the uh, search results. So that's cool. basically how it works, yeah. So if, if a client is asking you, um, like the example you're using is, I want to know the real estate sales for these five companies. How would you go about finding those web pages to make sure they are included in your index? Yeah, so um, what we basically do, we take the companies, we understand where the, where the most um, valuable or the relevant information in what websites they are. We can do that because we have a large scale, we have a search engine, so we know exactly where the information is. If 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 the if the sites aren't covered entirely, we we will we will crawl them. And then we will be a custom search on top on those websites. Then we will we will do the search and extract the relevant information from the results. That's roughly the process. Okay. And so when your when your client asks you to create something, how what what does that dialogue look like when they give you your requirements? Is it just a verbal communication, or do you have you know some keywords or other things that they're? You see where I'm going with this, probably. Okay. So. It, it, it's it's the best question you can ask. So honestly, like about six, seven months, we were customizing for every organization, and in the end, you don't want to customize. So what we have been doing, we have we have developed a GUI where the the the, the customers or the client they can select the vertical, they can uh, choose the list of companies. You can add throw a list of companies. They can define the tags. And then they are going. They, they can define the structure that they want to extract. And now they are they are starting to build the training set. For example, they are saying, "Okay, this article is relevant. This is irrelevant. Oh, this should be tagged commercial real estate deed. This should be tagged hospitality." They are building the training set. In the back, our algorithms understanding what they want to see, understanding mm -hmm. the structurization, and show them the results. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing instead of us customizing, we are letting the organization customize it with mm -hmm. AI. So this is all those, this field of augmented analytics mm -hmm. that to replace the analyst and data scientist with an AI. So that's where we are heading. So I want to be very careful because it's not necessarily replacing. It's making sure that the, the if you do have a limited amount of resources in the data science area that this can help supplement. There's always some human in the loop, right? Like the folks that you're talking about that are going in and writing the requirements, they still are data scientists usually doing that. It's just you're now taking their very unique skill set and um, enhancing it so it can be uh, done on a lot more stuff. It does sound like now you are um, tailoring to specific use cases with this GUI. So what are those use cases that you cover today? Currently, you want to track products or you want to track the technologies. So basically, currently, is companies and technologies, and the verticals can be uh, various. Okay, yeah, and that, that's pretty cool. So when you create, let's say, um, a, a, a company, a data source that you're going to allow people to use in this GUI, how do you define which companies are included? Is it just like a general search and they just find anything? Um, or is there like certain companies that you have uh, listed out that they can use? So basically, um, when you go to a client or customers, they, for example, if, if I am, say, a financial institute, I have competitors or I have clients or I have customers. They have the list. So mm -hmm. what they come in and plug the list into the system. For example, in the world of real estate, it's amazing. We have more than 100,000 real estate companies. Mm -hmm. Now we need this to be at scale, mm -hmm. and with scale come the noise. So mm -hmm. we had tools, no manual listings, no supervised learning. This was the starting point because we knew that the other two ways would just require too much time, efforts, cost. We, we a startup. It's to yeah, it, it can be very time intensive, but that's one thing that I maybe want to close out the conversation with is normally when I hear that there's no human in the loop um, with something that's kind of on the back end, that's not too alarming. But when it's search engines, there are some things that you might be missing. You know, if you're only looking at the queries and the web pages, it could be things that are pretty offensive. It could be things that are actually not factual. Um, it could be things that are inflammatory. So how are you addressing those concerns that a lot of people have today? 
Yeah, so uh, we have, um, I mean, there are, there are ma in the end, you have many parameters for a web page. For example, how informative the web page, how uh, offensive the web page. You have to understand the web page and keep the parameters. For example, if you're building, it's a project, it's, if, for example, you're building an ad tech technology, you want informative web pages. I don't want some blog or some, some, some stuff. I want things with import, with facts. So you mm -hmm. want to count how many facts the web page has, how many facts it covers, um, how, how many concepts it covers, and, and these are certain parameters that you do. And, and you have all those, all those uh, parameters inside the web page. And of course, in the end, don't forget that in the end, there is a user who clicks and mm -hmm. gives feedback. At least from the people I've talked to, not good enough. They don't want to be a, a, a reactive. They want it to be proactive, usually. Like, I know, you know, talking to some of the folks at U YouTube, even, um, they do flag certain videos uh, for a number of things that could be offensive or hurtful. And they do have a lot of machine learning, but they also have a lot of people that are just going through and checking it. And, you know, if you maybe said something on accident that didn't mean what you meant on a, on a video, um, you can always contest it. And a, there's a person there to, to look at it. So to your point, I think that's probably something that you would see in the B2C more than the B2B. The B2B is more of a closed uh, ecosystem where you know the data sets, the people that you're talking to can directly tell you, hey, this is offensive, take it out. It's not so um, click through analytics dependent, which I think is also um, important to note. And this is the problem I'm working on now. I want to do A-B testing without users. A-B less user testing. In the end, what you really want to do is to mimic user behaviors. And if a user is telling me that a video is offensive, mm. Like and and I and he knows it somehow. I want to build a machine that can tell me what a user thinks. This is the natural evolution. Like I think that in ten years of our, of us, like A/B testing will be just automatic. It will be machines that imitate user behavior and just replace it. So this is something that we are working now. Of course, now we have feedback loops and anyway, but in the end. That's true, but you still have to start with people somewhere. Like the the machine is is just a really smart calculator. You still have to give it the patterns to look at, and those still come from people. So even if ten years from now we're not using traditional A/B testing, which, I mean, even in my day job, A/B testing there is automation associated with it as well. Um, but you still have to start with real people at some point. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. If you want to share, like, where can people go and find more about you search and what are you, if you can share, is there anything interesting that's coming up in the next year that you'd want to share with the audience? Yeah, so we are, uh, so you can always welcome to usearch.com or contact me directly on LinkedIn. I'm quite active on LinkedIn. And uh, so we are now launching our market and uh, intelligence platforms uh, as uh, that, that I described in the beginning, that will be a really scalable tool for companies to do analysis. If you like Surge and, 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 and are interested in what we are doing, I'm always happy to discuss. Ashley, Ashley you know it, that I'm always love to discuss. Yeah, I have to say, like Roy has a, a great um, outlook on this stuff. He's great to talk to. We have uh different differing opinions on certain things but he's always very uh fun and energetic when we're talking about it anyways so i would encourage you all to go and check out uh the the cool stuff that he's working on